this show would be all male, while we, with female voices, you regale. Being mechanical, you ought not walk upon a laboring day without the sign of your profession. Uh, speak, what trade art thou? Why, sir, a carpenter. Where is thy leather apron and thy rule? <laughs> what dost thou with thy best apparel on? You, sir, what trade are you? Why, truly, sir, I am in respect of a fine workman, a cabler. <laughs> but what trade art thou? Answer me directly. A trade, sir, that I hope I may use in safe conscience, which is indeed, sir, a mender of bed so <laughs> Thou art a cobbler. Truly, sir, all that I live by is with thee all. <laughs> Wherefore art not in thy shop today? Why dost thou leave these men about the streets? So well, truly, sir, to wear out their shoes and to get myself into more work. <laughs> but indeed, sir, we may call it as a Caesar and I rejoice in his triumph. <laughs> Wherefore rejoice? For conquest brings he home. What tributaries follow him to Rome to grace in captive bonds his chariot wheels? Oh. You blocks. Ah. You stones. Worse than senseless things, oh you hard hearts, you cruel men of Rome! Knew you not Pompey? Many a time and oft have you climbed up to walls and battlements, to towers and windows, yea, to chimney tops. Your infants in your arms, and there have sat the live long day with patient expectation to see great Pompey pass the streets of Rome. But I have you saw his chariot but appear? Have you not made a universal shout that Tiber trembled in her banks to hear the replications of your sounds made in her concave shores? And do you now put on your best attire? Do you now call out a holiday that comes in triumph over Pompey's blood? Be gone! See where their basest metal be not moved. They vanish, tongue tied in their guiltiness. And go you down that way towards the capital. This way will I disrobe the images if you do find them death for ceremonies. May we do so? You know it is the feast of Cooper It is no matter. Let no images be hung with Caesar's trophies. I'll about to drive away the vulgar from the streets. So do you too, where you perceive them thick. These growing feathers plucked from Caesar's wing will make him fly an ordinary pitch. Who else would soar above the view of men and keep us all in servile fearfulness? <laughs> Antonio, Caesar, my lord, forget not in your speed, Antonio, to touch Calpurnia, for our elders say, the barren touch it in this holy chase, shake off their sterile curse. <laughs> I shall remember, when Caesar says do this, set on and leave no ceremony out. Caesar! Ah, who calls? Bid every noise be still, peace yet again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue shriller than all the music cries. Caesar, speak, Caesar's turn to hear. Beware the arts of march. What man is that? Our soothsayer bids you beware the arts of march. Set him before me, let me see his face. Fellow come from the throne, look upon Caesar. What sayest thou to me now? Speak once again. Beware the arts of march. He is a dreamer. Let us leave him pass. Will you go see the order of the course? Not I. I pray you do. I am not gamesome. I do lack some part of that quick spirit which is in Antony. I'll not hinder, Cassius, your desires. I'll leave you. Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eye that gentleness and show of love as I was wont to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over a friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. If I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with 
passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself, which give some soil, perhaps, to my behaviors. But let not, therefore, my good friends be grieved, of which number Cassius be you one, nor construe any further my neglect than that poor Brutus with himself at war forgets the shows of love to other men. Then, Brutus, I have much mistook your passion, by means whereof this breast of mine hath buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. Tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other things. It's just. And it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eyes, so that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except in war with Caesar, speaking of Brutus and groaning underneath his age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. What troubles would you lead me to, Cassus, to have me seek within myself for that which is not in me? Therefore, good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which yet you know not of. And be not jealous on me, gentle Brutus. Were I a common laughter, or did use to stale with ordinary oaths my love to every new protester? <laughs> if you know that I do fawn on men and hug them hard and after scandal them, or if you know that I profess myself in banqueting to all the rout, then hold me dangerous. Means the shouting. Do you fear the people choose Caesar for their king? I do you fear it? And I must think you would not have it so. Oh, I would not, Cassius. And I love him well. Wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it you would impart to me? If it be aught toward the general good, then set honor in one eye and death in the other, and I will look at both indifferently. For I do love honor more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I cannot tell what you or other men think of this life, but for my single self, I had as lief not to be as live to be in awe such a thing as I myself. I was born free as Caesar. So were you. We have both fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once, upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged it in and bade him follow. So indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. <laughs> But ere we could reach the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink! I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy the old Anchises bear upon his shoulders, so from the waves of Tiber did I the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god, and the wretched Cassius must bend his body if Caesar carelessly, but not on him. <sighs> Ye gods, it doth amaze me that a man of such a feeble temper should soak at the start of the majestic world and bear the whole of the world. And with a general shout, I do believe these applauses are some new honors he done, Caesar. Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some times are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. Well, what should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together. Yours is as fair a name. Sound them. It doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them. It is as heavy. Conjure with them. Brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. You do love me, I am nothing jealous. <laughs> what you would work me to, I have some aim. How I have thought of this and these things, I will recount hereafter, but for the present, dear friend, with love I do entreat you, be 
no further moved. What you have to say, I will with patience here. And find a time both me to hear and answer all these high things. But for my part, good friend, chew on this. Brutus had rather be a villager than to repute himself the son of Rome during these harsh conditions as these times are like to lay upon us. I'm glad that my weak words have struck but thus much show a fire from Brutus. But the games are done and season is returning. As they pass by, I cough by the sea but he will after the sour fashion tell us what hath proceeded worthy note today. We'll do so. But look you, Cassius. Every spot doth glow on Caesar's brow, and all the rest are like a chidden train. Calpurnius' cheek is pale, and Cicero looks with such ferret and such fiery eyes as we have seen him in the capital being crossed in conference by some senators. Cassio will tell us what the matter is. Antonio! Caesar! Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek headed men, and such as sleep a night. Young Cassius has a lead. Hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar. He is not dangerous. He is a noble Roman and well given. Would he were fatter. But I fear him not. Yet if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid so soon as that spare Cassius. He reads much. He is a great observer. And he looks quite through the deeds of men. He loves no plays, does thou lost Antony. He hears no music. Seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he be never at heart's ease whilst they behold a greater than themselves, and therefore are they very dangerous. I rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear, for always I am Caesar. Come on my right hand, for this ear is deaf, and tell me truly what thou thinkst of him. You pulled me by the cloak, would you speak with me? Aye, Casca, tell us what a chance today that Caesar looks so sad. Why, you were with him, were you not? I should not then ask Casca what a chance. <laughs> Why, uh, there was a crown offered him, and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand thus, and the people fell a-shouting. Uh, who offered him the crown? Why, Antony. Tell us the manner of it, gentle Casca. I can as well be hanged as tell the manner of it. It were mere foolery. I did not mark it. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown, only it was not a crown neither. It was one of these, these coronets. And as I said, he put it by once. But for all that, to my thinking, he would fain have had it. And then he offered it again. He put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very loath to lay his fingers off it. And then he offered it a third time. He put it a third time by, and still as he refused it, the rabblement hooted and clapped to their chapped hands and uttered such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar had refused the crown that it had almost choked Caesar, for he swooned and fell down at it. <laughs> for my own part, I durst not laugh for fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air. But soft, I pray you, what did Caesar swoon? He fell down in the marketplace and foamed at the mouth and was speechless. Tis very like he hath the falling sickness. No, Caesar hath it not, but you and I and honest Casca, we have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that, but I am sure Caesar fell down. Uh, did Cicero say anything? Aye, he spoke Greek. To what effect? Nay, and if I tell you that, I'll never look you in the face again. But. Those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads, but for my own part, it was Greek to me. Farewell. There was more foolery yet if I could mark it. Will you sup with me tonight, Casca? Uh, no. I'm promised forth. Will you dine with me tomorrow? Aye. If I be alive and your mind hold and your dinner worth the eating. Good. I'll expect you. Do so. Farewell both. What a blunt fellow is this grown to be. He was quick metal when he went to school. This rudeness is sauce to his good wit, which gives men's stomach to digest his words with better appetite. Oh, so it is. <laughs> with this, I'll leave you. Tomorrow, if it please you to speak with me, I'll come home to you. Or, if you will, come home to me and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Well, 
wouldest thou art noble, but I see thy honorable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Therefore it is meet that noble minds keep ever with their likes, for who is so firm that cannot be seduced? Caesar doth bear me hard, but he loves Brutus. Brutus were me, and I were Brutus. He would not humor me. I will this night, in several hands, in at his windows throw, as if they come from several citizens, writings all tending to the great opinion Rome has of his name, wherein, obscurely, Caesar's ambition shall be glanced at. After that, let Caesar seat him sure, for we will shake him or worse days endure. Lightens, opens graves, and roars, that doth the lion in the capital. 
A man no mightier than thyself or me in personal action, but prodigious grown and fearful, like these strange eruptions are. Tis Caesar that you mean is not Cassius? Let it be who it is. The Romans now have themes and limbs like to their ancestors, but have hoed a while. Our fathers' minds are dead, and we are governed with our mothers' spirits. Our yoke and sufferance show us womanish. Indeed, they they say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a king, and he will wear his crown by land and sea in every place save here in Italy. I know where I will wear this dagger then. Cassius from bondage will deliver Cassius. Therein, ye gods, you make the weak most strong. Therein, ye gods, you tyrants do defeat. Nor stony tower, nor walls of beaten brass, nor airless dungeon, nor strong links of iron can be retentive to the strength of spirit. But life, being weary of these worldly bars, never lacks the power to dismiss itself. If I know this, know all the world beside. That part of tyranny that I do bear, I can shake off at pleasure. So can I. So every bondman bears in his own hand the power to cancel his captivity. Why should Caesar be a tyrant then? Poor man, I know he would not be a wolf, but he sees the Romans are but sheep. He were no lion when our Roman times. Those that will with haste make a mighty fire begin it with weak straws. What trash is Rome! What rubbish and what awful when it serves as the base matter to illuminate so vile a thing as Caesar. Oh, what old grief, where hast thou led me? Perhaps I speak this before a willing bondman must be made, but I am armed, and dangers are to me indifferent. You speak to Casca, and to such a man that is no fleering telltale. Hold my hand. Be factious for redress of all these griefs, and I will set this foot of mine as far as who goes farthest. There's a bargain made. <laughs> now know you, Casca. I have moved already some certain of the noblest-minded Romans to undergo with me an enterprise of honorable, dangerous consequence. And know you by this, they stay for me in Pompey's porch. For this, now this fearful night, there is no stir walking in the streets, and the complexion of the elements in favor is like the work we have in hand. Most bloody, fiery, and most terrible. Stand close a while, for here comes one in haste. To Cinna, I do know him by his gate. Where haste you so, Cinna? To find out you and who is that? Metellus Simber? It is Casca and one in corporate to our tents. Oh, oh, stand on. On. What a fearful night is this. There's some two, three of us who have and seen mine on stay for. Tell me. Yes, you are. Oh, Cassius, if you could but win the noble Brutus to our Be cause. Be content. But Cinna, mm -hmm. take you this letter. And see you lay it in the praetor's chair where Brutus may but find it. And throw that in at his window. Set that up with wax on old Brutus' statue. All that done, repair to Pompey's porch where you will find us. Is Decius Brutus and Trebonius there? All but Metellus Simber, and he's gone to seek you at your house. <laughs> well, I will hide. And so stow these papers as you so pay me. That done, repair to Pompey's theater. Come, Casca, you and I will yet ere day see Brutus at his house. Three parts of him is ours already, and upon the next encounter, the man in Tyre yields him ours. He sits high in all the people's hearts, and that which would appear offense in us, his countenance, like rich alchemy, can change to virtue and to worthiness. Him and his worth and our great need of him, you have right well conceded. Let us go. For it is ere midnight, and before day, we will wake him and be sure of him. Uh, my study, 
And when it is light, come and call me here. Hello, my lord. It must be by his death. For my part, I have no personal cause to spurn him, but for the general, he would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that calls forth the adder, and that craves wary walking. Crown him that, and I do grant. We put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. Therefore think him as the serpent's egg, which, hatched, will, like its kind, grow mischievous and kill him in the shell. The taper burneth in your closet, sir. Searching the window for a flint, I found this paper. Thus sealed up, and I am sure it did not lie there when I went to bed. Get you to bed again. It is not yet day. Is not tomorrow, boy, the first of March? I know not, sir. Look in a calendar and bring me word. I will, sir. Exhalations whizzing in the air give light enough to read by them. Brutus, thou sleepst, awake and see thyself. Shall Rome, etc. Speak, strike, redress. Brutus, thou sleepst, awake. Such instigations have all been dropped where I picked them up. Shall Rome, etc. And all this I must piece it out. Shall Rome stand under one man's awe? My ancestors did from the streets of Rome, the Tarquin Drive, when he was named a king. Speak, strike, redress. Am I thus entreated to speak and strike? Oh, no. If the redress will follow, I make thee promise. Thou shalt receive thy full petition at the hands of Brutus. Sir, March has wasted fifteen days. Go to the door, someone knocks. Cassius wedded me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion of it, all the interim is like a phantasma or a hideous dream. The genius and the mortal instrument have been at council, and the state of man, like to a little kingdom, suffers the nature of an insurrection. Sir, tis your brother Cassius at the door who doth desire to see you. Is he alone? No, sir, there are more with him. Do you know them? No, sir, their hats are plucked about their ears and half their faces buried in their cloaks, that by no means I may discover them by any mark of favor. Let him enter. They are the faction. Oh, conspiracy. Shamest thou to show thy dreadful face by night when evils are most free? Where then by day? Where wilt thou find a cavern dark enough to hide thee from prevention? Seek none, conspiracy. Hide it in spa smiles and affability. For if thou path thy native semblance on, even Erebus itself is not dim enough to hide thee from prevention. I think we are too bold upon your rest. Good morrow, Brutus. Can we trouble you? I have been up this hour awake all night. Know why these men who come along with you? Yes, every man of them, and no man here but honors you. This is Trebonius. He is welcome here. This Decius Brutus. He is welcome too. This Casca. This Cinna. And this Metellus Simber. They are welcome all. Tell me, what dreadful cares interpose themselves betwixt your eyes and night? Shall I entreat a word? Here lies the east. Doth not the day break here? No. Pardon, sir, it doth. <laughs> and yon gray lies that brought the clouds are messengers of day. You shall confess that you are both deceived. Here, as I point my sword, the sun arises, which is a great way growing on the south, waiting in the youthful season of the year. Some two months hence, up higher toward the north, he first presents his fire, and the high east stands as the capital, directly here. Give me your hands, all over one by one. 
Let us swear our resolution. No, not an oath. If not the face of men, the, the sufferance of their souls, the time's abuse, if, if these be motives weak, break off the times and every man hands to his idle bed, and let high-sided tyranny range on till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I'm sure they do, bear fire enough to kindle cowards and still with valor the melting spirits of women, then countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoke the word and will not palter? What other oath than honesty to honesty engaged? This it shall be, or we will fall for it. Let priests and cowards and men cautelous, old feeble carrions and such suffering souls as welcome wrongs. Unto bad causes swear such creatures that men doubt. But do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise, nor the insuppressive metal of our spirits, to think that or our act or our performance did need an oath. For every drop of blood that every Roman bears, and nobly bears, is guilty of a several bastardy if he do break the smallest promise of any article of promise that hath passed from him. But what of Cicero? Shall we sound him? I think he should stand very strong with us. Let us not leave him out. No, by no means. Oh, let us have him. For his silver hairs will purchase us a good opinion, and buy men's voices to commend our deeds. It shall be said, his judgment ruled our hands. Our youth and wildness shall not quite appear, but all be buried in his gravity. Name him not. Let us not break with him. He will never follow anything that other men begin. Then leave him out. Indeed, he is not fit. Shall no man else be touched but on this either? Decious, well urged. I think it is not meet Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. We shall find him a shrewd contriver, and know you his means if he improve them may well stretch so far as to annoy us all, which to prevent, let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius. To cut the head off and then hack the limbs, like wrath and death and envy afterwards, Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us be sacrificers, but not butchers, Caius. We all stand up against the spirit of Caesar, and in the spirit of men there is no blood. That we could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar. <laughs> but alas, he must bleed for it. Therefore, countrymen, let us kill him boldly, but not wrathfully. Let us carve him as a dish fit for the gods, not hew him as a carcass fit for hounds, and let our hearts, as subtle masters do, stir their servants to an act of rage, and then after seem to chide them. This will make our purpose necessary, not envious, which, so appearing to the common eye, will be called perjurers, not murderers. As for Antony, think not of him. He can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. Yet I fear him for the engrafted love he bears to Caesar. Alas, good Cassius, do not think of him. If he do love Caesar, all that he can do is to himself, take thought and die for Caesar, which is as much he should, because he's taken to sports and wildness and much company. Fear him not. Let him not die, for he will live and laugh with this hereafter. Peace. It is time to part. But it is doubtful yet whether Caesar will come forth this day or no. For he is superstitious, grown of late, quite from the main opinion he had held once of fantasies of dreams and ceremonies. It may be these apparent prodigies, the unaccustomed terror of this night, and the persuasion of his augurers may hold him from the capital today. Never fear that. If he be so resolved, I can or sway him. When I tell him he hates flatterers, he says he does, being then most flattered. <laughs> Let me work. I can give his humor the true bent, and I will bring him to the Capitol. May we will all of us be there to fetch him. By the eighth hour, is that the uttermost? Be that the uttermost. Fail not, then. And Caius Ligarius doth bear Caesar hard, who rated him for speaking well of Pompey. I wonder, none of you have thought of him? Good Metellus, go you along by him. He loves me well, and I've given him reasons. 
Bring him hither, I'll fashion him. Morning comes upon us, we'll leave you, Brutus. And friends, disperse yourselves. And all remember what you have said, and show yourselves true Romans. Well, good friends, look fresh and merrily. Let not your faces put on our purposes, but bear them as the Roman actors do, with untired spirits and formal constancy. So good morrow to you, everyone. Lucius! Oh, what to sleep. It is no matter. Enjoy the honey-heavy dew of slumber. Thou hast no figures nor no fantasies which work their busy cares in the brains of men, therefore thou sleep so soundly. Brutus, my lord. Joshua, what mean you? What arrives you now? It is not for your condition, for your health, to submit your weak condition to the raw cold morning. No, for yours neither. You run gently, Brutus, stole from my bed. And yesternight at supper you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across. And when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks and with an angry wafture of your hand gave sign for me to leave you. So I did, hoping it was but an effect of humor which sometime hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep. And could it work so much upon your shape as it had much prevailed on your condition, I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I am not well in health, that is all. Brutus is wise, and were you not in health, you would embrace the means to come by. Why, so I do. Portia, go to bed. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humors of the dank morning? What, is Brutus sick? And will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No, oh, my Brutus, you have some sick offense within your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. And upon my knees I charm you, by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one, that you unfold to me yourself you are half. Why, you are heavy. And what men tonight have had to resort to you? For here have been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from darkness. Gentle Portia, do not kneel. I should not need if you were gentle, Brutus. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted that I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself? But as it were, in sort or limitation to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Brutus Harlot, not his wife. You are my true and honorable wife, as dear to me as are the ruddy drops that visit my sad heart. If this were true, then should I know this secret? I grant I am a woman, but withal a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant I am a woman, but withal a woman well-reputed Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels. I'll not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound here in the thigh. Can I bear that with patience and not my husband's secrets? Render me worthy of such a noble wife. Hark, hark, one knocks. Go in a while. By and by, thy bosom shall partake all the secrets of my heart. All my engagements I will construe to thee, all the correctory of my sad brow. Leave me in haste. Lucius, who's that Knox? He is a sick man that would speak with you. Oh, Caius Ligarius, the good tellus here. Go. The boy, step aside. Caius Ligarius! How? Not safe, good morrow, from a feeble tongue. What a night hast thou chose out to wear a kerchief? Would you were not sick? I am not sick. Brutus had in hand any exploit worthy of the name of honor. Such an exploit have I at hand, if you've a healthful ear to hear it. By all the gods that Romans bow before, I here discard my sickness. 
soul of Rome. Brave son derived from honorable loins, thou, like an exorcist, hast conjured up my mortified spirit. Now bid me run, and I will strive with things impossible. Yea, get the better of them. Hmm? What's to do? Such a piece of work that will make sick men whole. But are not some whole, then we must make sick. That we must also. What it is, my Caius, I will unfold to thee as we are going, to whom it should be done. Set on your foot, and with a heart new fire I follow you. To do I know not what, but it sufficeth that Brutus leads me on. Follow me then. You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar shall force. The things that threaten me ne'er look by on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished, Caesar. I never stood on ceremonies. And now they fright me. There is one within, besides the things that we have heard and seen, recounts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets. And graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fight upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons and bright forms of war, which drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurtled in the air. Horses to neigh and dying men did groan and ghosts and shriek and squeal about the streets. Caesar, these things are beyond all use. And I do fear them. What can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. What say the augurers? They would not have you to stir forth today. Plucking the entrails of an offering forth, they could not find a heart within the beast. Gods do this in shame of cowardice. Caesar should be a beast without a heart if he should stay at home today for fear. No, Caesar shall not. Danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are two lions littered in one day, and I the elder and more terrible. And Caesar shall go forth. Last my lord. Your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. Well, send Mark Antony to the Senate house, and he shall say you are not well today. Let me, upon my knee, prevail in this. Mark Antony shall say I am not well. And for thy humor, I will stay at home. Here's Decius Brutus, he shall tell them so. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow, worthy Caesar, I come to bend you to the Senate house. And you are come in very happy time to bear my greetings to the senators and tell them that I will not come today. Cannot is false and that I dare not falser. I will not come today, tell them so, Decius. Say he is sick. Shall Caesar send a lie? Have I in conquest stretched mine arm so far to be afraid to tell graybeards the truth? Decius. Go and tell them Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. The cause is in my will. I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But for your private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know. Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. She dreamt tonight she saw my statua 
which like a fountain with a hundred spouts did run pure blood. And many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And these she does apply for warnings and portents and evils imminent, and on her knee hath begged that I will stay at home today. This dream is all a misinterpreted. It was a vision fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in many pipes, in which so many smiling Romans bathed, signifies that from you great Rome shall suck reviving blood, and that great men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics, and cognizance. This by Calpurnia's dream is signified. <laughs> and this way you have well expounded it. I have, when you have heard what I can say. And know it now, the Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word you will not come, their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock act to be rendered for someone to say, break up the Senate till another time when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper? No, Caesar is afraid. Pardon me, Caesar, for my dear, dear love to your proceeding bids me tell you this, and reason to my love is liable. How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia? I am ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, or I will go. And look where Publius has come to fetch me. Tomorrow, Caesar. Welcome, Publius. What, Brutus, are you stirred so early to? Tomorrow, Casca. Caius Ligeris. Caesar was ne'er so much your enemy as that same ague which hath made you lean. Uh, what is the clock? Well, oh, Caesar, it hath struck an eight. Thank you for your pains and courtesy. Oh, see, at me that rebel's longer night is notwithstanding up with Morrow, Antony. So too, most noble Caesar. I bid them prepare within. I am to blame to be thus waited for. Now Sinna, now Metellus, what Trebonius! I have an hour's talk in store for you today. Remember that you call on me. Be near me, that I may remember you. Caesar, I will. And so there will I be that his best friend will wish I had no further. Good friends, go in and taste some wine with me, and we, like friends, will straight away go together. Every like is not the same. Caesar, the heart of Brutus yearns to think upon. Caesar, where Brutus, take heed of Cassius, and not of Ea and Casca. Heaven I to Sinna, trust not Trebonius, mark well in the tell of Simper. Decius Brutus loves thee not. I was wronged, Caius Ligarius. There is but one mind in all these men, and it is bent against Caesar. If thou beest not immortal, look about you. Security gives way to conspiracy. Mighty gods defend thee. Thy lover, Artemidorus. Here will I stand till Caesar pass along, and as a suitor will I give him this. My heart laments that virtue cannot live out of the teeth of emulation. If thou read this, O oh Caesar, thou mayest live. If not, the fates with traitors do contrive. I pray thee, boy, run to the Senate house. Stay not to answer me, but get thee gone. Why dost thou stay? To know my errand, madam? I would have had thee there and here again, ere I can tell thee what thou should do there. Oh, Constancy, be strong upon my side. Set a huge mountain between my heart and tongue. I have a man's mind, but a woman's might. How hard it is for women to keep counsel. Art thou here yet? Madam, what should I do? Run to the capital and nothing else, and so return to you and nothing else? Yes. Bring me word, boy, if thy lord look well, for he went safely forth. And take good note what Caesar doth, what suitors press to him. Hark, boy, what noise is that? I hear none, madam. Pretty, listen well. I heard a bustling rumor like a fray, and the wind brings it from the capital. Sooth, madam, I hear nothing. Come hither, fellow. Which way hast thou been? At mine own house, good lady. What is it o'clock? About the ninth hour, lady. Is Caesar yet gone to the capital? Madam, not yet. 
I go to take my stand to see him pass unto the cabinet. Well, thou hast some suit to Caesar, hast thou not? That I have, lady. If it will please Caesar to be so good to Caesar as to hear me, I shall beseech him to befriend himself. Why? Knowest thou any harms intended towards him? None that I know will be much that I fear may chance. Good morrow to you. Here the street is narrow. The throng that follows Caesar at the heels of senators, raiders, common suitors, will crowd a feeble man almost to death. Look at me to a place more void, and there speak to great Caesar as he comes along. I must go in. By me, a weak thing the heart of woman is. Oh, Brutus, heaven speed thee in thine enterprise. Sure, the boy heard me. Brutus hath a suit that Caesar will not grant. Oh, heaven grow faint. Run, Lucius, commend me to my lord. Say, I am merry. Come back again and bring me word what he doth say to thee. The eyes of Mars are come. I, Caesar, but not to God. Hail, Caesar, read this schedule. Timonius doth desire you to all read it. Your best pleasure, this is humble. Oh, Caesar, read my verse. For mine's a suit that touches Caesar nearer. Read it, great Caesar. What touches us ourselves shall be last, sir. Delay not, Caesar. Read it instantly. What is the fellow mad? Yes, Here out his place. But urge you your petitions in the streets. Come to the capital. Cassius, be constant. Amelia's Lena speaks not to our purposes, but look, he smiles, and Caesar does not change. Trebonius knows it's time for look, he draws Mark Antony out of the way. Where is Metellus Simba? I can go and presently prefer his suit to Caesar. He is addressed. Press near and second him. Cassius, you are the first that raise your hand. Are we all ready? What is amiss that Caesar and the Senate must regress? Most high, most mighty, and most puissant, Caesar, Metellus Simber throws before thy seat a humble heart. I must prevent thee, Simber. These couchings and these lowly courtesies might fire the blood of ordinary men. But be not fond to think that Caesar bears such rebel blood that will be thawed from the true quality with that which melteth fools. I mean, sweet words, low crooked curtsies, and base spaniels fawning. Thy brother by decree is banished. If thou dost bend and pray and fawn for him, I spurn thee like a cur out of my way. No, Caesar doth not wrong, nor without cause will he be satisfied. Is there no voice more worthy than my own to sound? more sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother? I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar. In desiring thee that Publius Simber be given immediate freedom of repeal. What, Brutus? Pardon, Caesar, Caesar, pardon, as low as to thy foot doth Cassius fall to beg enfranchisement for Publius Simber. I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me. But I am constant as the northern star, of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. The skies are painted with unnumbered sparks. They are all fire, and every one doth shine. Yet there is one in all doth hold his place. So in the world, tis furnished well with men, and men are flesh and blood and apprehensive. Yet in the number I do know but one that unassailable holds on his rank, unshaped of motion, and that I am he. Let me show it a little lean in this, that I was constant. Simber should be banished, and constant do remain to keep him so. O oh, Caesar! Hence wilt thou lift up Olympus? Great Caesar! Doth not Brutus bootless kneel? Speak hands for me! <gasps>
you through ten. Then fall, Caesar! Part, 
To you, our swords have leaden points, Mark Antony. Our arms in strength of malice and our hearts in brother's temper do welcome you with all kind love, good thoughts, and reverence. Your voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities. Um, but be patient until we have appeased the multitudes besides themselves with fear. Then we shall deliver unto you the reason why I, that loved Caesar when I struck him, have thus proceeded. I doubt not of your wisdom. Let each man render me his bloody hand. First, Marcus Brutus, will I shake with you? Next, Caius Cassius, go take your hand. Audacious Brutus, yours? No, yours, Matthias. Yours, sir. My valiant Casca, yours? The last, not least in love, yours, good Trebonius. Gentlemen all, alas, what shall I say? My credit now stands on such slippery ground that if one or two bad ways you must conceit me, either a coward or a flatterer. But I did love thee, Caesar, which is true. If then thy spirit should look upon us now, shall it not grieve thee dear to thy death to see thy empty, making his peace, shaking the bloody fingers of thy folks? Mark Antony, pardon me, Caius Cassius. The enemies of Caesar shall say he then in a friend. It is cold modesty. I blame thee not for praising Caesar so. But what of compact do mean you to have with us? Will you be pricked in number of our friends, or shall we on and not depend on you? Therefore I took your hands, but was indeed swayed from the point by looking down on Caesar. Friends, I am with you all and love you all. Upon this hope, you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Or else this were a savage spectacle. Our reasons are of such good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you would be satisfied. That is all I seek. And in more of a suitor, that I may produce his body to the marketplace, and in the pulpit, as becomes a friend, speak in order of his funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Mark Antony speak in his funeral. I know you how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter. Under your pardon, I will enter the pulpit first and give good reason for our Caesar's death. What Antony shall speak, I shall say he speaks by leave and by permission, and that we are content Caesar shall have all true rites and lawful ceremonies. It shall advantage more than do us wrong. I know not what we fall, I like it not. Come then, Mark Antony. Take you Caesar's body. You shall not, in your funeral speech, blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar, and say you do it by our permission. Else shall you have no hand at all about his funeral. And you shall speak in the same pulpit that I am going once my speech is ended. Be it so. I do desire no more. Prepare the body then, and follow us. men that ever lived in the tide of times. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall come o'er all the parts of Italy. Blood and destruction will be so in use, and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war. All pity choked with custom of fell deeds, and Caesar's spirit, raging for revenge with Ate by his side from out from hell, shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry, Hellman! And let us slip the dogs of war, that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrying men groaning for burial. You serve Octavius Caesar, do you not? I do, Mark Antony. Caesar did write for him to come to Rome. He did receive his letters and his coming, and bid me say to you by word of mouth. Caesar! Thy 
apart is big, get thee apart and weep. Passion I see is catching, for mine eyes seeing some beads of sorrow stand and I begin to water. Is thy master coming? He lies tonight within seven leagues of Rome. Post back with speed and tell him I'll have chance. Here is a morning Rome, a dangerous Rome, no Rome of safety for Octavius yet. I hence and tell him so. Yet, stay a while. Thou shalt look back till I have borne this body into the marketplace. There shall I try in my oration how the people take the cruel issue of these bloody men, according to the which thou shalt dispatch to young Octavius the state of things. Let me your hand. Evil. 
evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turned with their bones. Mm -hmm. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. No. Aye. 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 is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. I had to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He has brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the loop recall, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. What's his ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke. But here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Oh, children, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me, my heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Methinks there is much reason in his sayings. If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Has he answered? I fear the little worse than him. Far he his way to take not to take the crown, though, which is certain he was not ambitious. If it be found so, some will dear abide it. Poor soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man, no, no, no more no. no. against no. the no. But that yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Mm. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh. Oh. Masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do that wrong. I'd rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than to wrong such honorable men. But here is a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which Pardon me, I do not mean to read. No, 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 no. Oh, patience, gentle friends, I must not read. It does not mean to know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. And being men bearing the will of Caesar it will inflame you, it will make you mad. It is good you know not that you are his heirs. Or if you showed up, oh, what would come of it? Now read the will. Be patient. We what? stay away. Ah! I have not shot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do not want to play to this
hypocrisy who feel the dint of pity. These are gracious jobs. Kind souls, what? Weep you when you behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Mm -hmm. Look you here. Here is himself. Oh, oh, Hard as you see oh, with traitor. Oh, pity a spectacle. Oh, the noble Caesar. Oh, woeful day. Traitor's villain. Oh, my God. Brother two must die and send you letters? I do consent. Pick 
down, Antony. Upon condition, Publius shall not live. Who is your sister's son, Mark Antony? He shall not live. Look, to the spot, I damn him. But let us go you to Caesar's house and fetch the bill hither. We shall determine how to cut off some charge and legacies. What, shall I find you here? Or here at the capital? <clears throat> a slight, a miracle man, meet to be sent on errands. Is it fit the threefold world divided he should stand one of the three to share it? So you thought it, and took his boys, who should be pricked to die in our black sentence and prescription. Octavius, I have seen more days than you. And though we lay these honors on this man to ease our sails of diverse slanderous loads, he shall but bear them as the ass bears gold, to groan and sweat under the business, either led or driven as we point the way. And, having brought our treasure where we will, then take me down his load and turn him off. Like to the empty ass to shake its ears and graze in commons. And in this taste is Lepidus but so. He should be taught and trained and bid go forth to not talk of him as but a property. And now Octavius, listen great things. Brutus and Cassius are levying powers. We must straight make head. Therefore let our lines be combined. Our best friends made, our means stretched. And let us presently go sit in council, how covert matters be best disclosed, and open perils surest answer it. Let us do so, for we are at the stake and made about with many enemies, and some that smile have in their hearts, I fear, millions of mischiefs. Enlarge your griefs, and I will give you audience. Hinderus, bid our commanders leave their charges off a little from this ground. Lucilius, you do the like. Let no man come to our tent till our conference is done. Let Lucius and Titinius guard the door. That you have wronged me doth appear in this. You have condemned and noted Lucius Pella for taking bribes here of the Sardians, wherein my letter is praying on his side because I knew the man was slighted off. You wronged yourself to write in such a case. In such a time as this, it is not meet that every nice offense should bear his calm. Let me tell you, Cassius, you yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm, to sell and mart your offices for gold to undeservers. I an itching palm. You know that you are Brutus that speak this, else this speech were else your last. Tis the name of Cassius that honors this corruption, and chastisement doth therefore hide his head. Chastisement! Remember March, the Ides of March, remember? Did not great Julius bleed for justice' sake? What villain that hath touched his body, that hath stabbed, and not for justice? What, shall one of us that struck the foremost man in all this world but for supporting robbers? Shall we contaminate our fingers with base bribes for so much trash as may be grasped thus? I tell you, I would rather be a dog and bathe the moon than such a Roman. Brutus, bait not me, I'll not endure it. You forget yourself to hedge me in? I am a soldier, I older in practice, abler than yourself. Go to, to you are not Cassius. I am. You are not. Urge me no farther, I shall forget myself. A very slight man. Oh, it's possible. Hear me, for I will speak. Must I give way and room to your rash caller? Must I be affrighted when a madman stares? Ye gods, ye gods, must I endure all this? Oh, all this and more. Fret till your proud heart break. Go, oh, show your slaves how choleric you are. Make your bondmen tremble. Must I budge? Must I observe you? Must I stand and crouch under your testy humor? By the gods, 
You shall digest the venom of your sting, though we do split you from it this day forward. I shall use you for my mirth, yea, for my laughter when you are waspish. Is it come to this? You say you are a better soldier. Make it appear so, prove your vaunting true. It shall please me well. For my part, I shall be glad to learn of noble men. You wrong me every way, you wrong me, Brutus. I said an elder soldier, not a better. Did I say a better? If you did, I care not. When Caesar lived, he durst not thus have moved me. Oh, peace, peace, you durst not so have tempted him. I durst not. No, I durst not tempt him. For your life, you durst not. Do not presume too much upon my love. I may do that, I shall be sorry for. You have done that you should be sorry for. There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats. For I am armed so strong in honesty that it doth pass by me as the idle winds which I respect not. I did send to you for a certain sum of gold which you denied me. Was this done like Cassius? Should I respond to Caius Cassius so? Oh, when Marcus Brutus becomes so covetous to lock those rascal counters from his friends, be ready, ye gods, with all your thunderbolts, dash him to pieces. I denied thee not. You did. I did not. He was a fool that brought my answer back. Brutus bribed my heart. A friend should bear his friend's infirmities, but Brutus makes mine greater than they are. I do not, unless you practice them on me. You love me not. I do not like your faults. A friendly eye could never see such faults. The flatterers would not, though it should seem as huge as high Olympus. Come, Antony, and go not Octavius, come. Revenge yourselves alone on Cassius, for Cassius is a weary of the world, hated by one he loves. How <coughs> could we be scared from my eyes? There is my dagger, and here my naked breast, within a heart dearer than Pluto's mind, richer than gold. Take it as thou beest the Roman, take it forth. Strike as thou didst at Caesar, for I know that when thou did, didst hate him worse, thou lovest him better than ever thou lovest Cassius. Sheathe your dagger. Be angry when you will, it shall have scope. Do what you will. Dishonor shall be humor. Cassius more yoked with the lamb that carries anger as the flint bears fire, which much enforced shows a hasty spark and then straight as cold again. As Cassius lived to be but mirth and laughter to his Brutus, when grief and blood ill-tempered vexeth him, I spoke that I was ill-tempered too. Do you confess as much? Give me your hand. And my heart too. Brutus. What's the matter? <laughs> Love enough to deal with me when that rash humor which my mother gave me makes me forgetful. Yes, Cassius. And when you are over earnest with your Brutus, he will think your mother chides and leave you so. Lucilius, Titinius, bid the commanders prepare to launch their companies tonight. Uh, and come yourselves and bring Masala immediately back with you. Lucius, a bowl of wine. I did not think you could have been so angry. Cassius, I'm sick of many griefs. Of your philosophy, you make little use if you give way to accidental evils. No man bears sorrow better. Portia is dead. Portia? She is dead. How escaped I killing when I crossed you so? How insupportable and touching loss upon what sickness? Patient of my absence? and grief that young Octavius with Mark Antony have made themselves so strong. But with her death, that tidings came. She then fell distract, and her attendants being absent swallowed fire. And died so. Even so. Oh, you want that? Speak no more of her. Give me a bowl of wine. <clears throat> With this, I bury all unkindness, Cassius. My heart is thirsty for that noble pledge. Fair <laughs> Lucius, for the wine of swelled cup, I cannot drink too much of Brutus. Come in, Titinius. Welcome, Masala. 
Now, so we round this taper here and call to question all necessities. Are you no more? Hmm. Masala, I have letters here speaking that uh, Mark Antony with Octavius have come upon us with a mighty force bending their expedition toward Philippi. Myself have letters of the self-same tenor. With what addition? That with by prescription and bills of outlawry, Octavius, Antony, and Lepidus have put to death a hundred senators. There in our letters do not want agree. Mine speak of seventy senators that have died by their prescriptions. Cicero being one. Cicero? Cicero is dead. And by that order of prescription. I do your letters from your wife, my lord. No, Masala. Nor nothing in your letters rid of her. Nothing, Masala. Everything's is straight. Why do you ask? Hear you aught of her and yours? No. Now, as you are a Roman, speak true. And like a Roman, bear the truth I tell. For certain she is dead, and by strange manner. Farewell, Portia. We all must die, Miss Alma. And with meditating that she must die once, I have the patience to endure. So great men, great losses should endure. I have as much of this in art as you, and yet my nature could not bear it. Well, to our work alive, what think you of marching on Philippi presently? You're not thinking good. Your reason? Yes, <laughs> it is. Tis better that the enemy seek us. So shall he, weary as soldiers, waste his means doing his self defense, whilst we lie still. Are full of rest, defense, and nimbleness. Good reasons must of force give way to better. The people that stand betwixt Philippi and this place stand but in a forced affection, for they have grudged us contribution. The enemy marching along by them, by them shall make a fuller number up, come on refreshed, new added, and encouraged. From this advantage may we cut them off. If at Philippi we meet them there, these people at our backs. Hear me, good brother. By, by your leave, there is one note beside. We have tried the utmost of our friends. Our legions are brimful, our cause is ripe. The enemy increaseth every day. We at the height are ready to decline. There is a tide in the affairs of man which Taken at the flood bleeds on to fortune. Omitted, all our ventures are bound in shallows and in miseries. At such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. And with your will go on, we will along ourselves and we come at full advice. The dark of night has crept upon our talk, and nature must obey necessity, which we will never give over the rest. There is no more to say. No more. Good night. Early tomorrow we will rise and hence. Lucius, my gown. Goodbye, Miss Alla. Farewell. Noble, noble passes. Good night and good repose. Oh, my dear brother. This was an ill beginning of the night. Never let such division come between our souls. Let it not, Brutus. Everything is well. Good night, my lord. Good night, good brother. Good night, good night, Lord Brutus. Good night to you, everyone. Give me my gown. Where's thy instrument? Here in the tent. What? Thou speaks drowsily. May I blame thee not that art or watched. Can thou keep up thy heavy eyes a while and touch thy instrument a strain or two? Aye, sir, and to please you. <laughs> it does, my lord. I trouble thee too much, but thou art willing. Tis my duty, my lord. I should not urge thy duty past thy might. For I know that young bloods look for a time of rest. I have slept, my lord, already. It was well done. Thou shalt sleep again. I will not keep thee long. If I do live, I will be good to thee.
pretty tune is this? Oh, monstrous slumber, layest thou thy leaden mace upon my boy that plays thee music. Gentle knave, good night. It would not do thee so much harm to wake thee. Oh, if thou not, thou breaks thy instrument. Turned down where I left reading. Oh, Ill this taper burns. Ah, who comes here? I think it is the weakness of my eyes that shapes this monstrous apparition. It comes upon me. Are there anything? I've got some god, some angel, or some devil that makes my blood turn cold and my hair to stare. What art thou? Thy evil spirit, Brutus. How comes that? To tell thee thou shalt see me at Philippi. Now I have taken heart thou, thou vanishest. Evil spirit, I would hold more talk with thee. The boy awake! Those are the strings of my lord are full. I can see still in his instrument. Lucius, awake! My lord? Didst thou dream that thou cried out so? My lord, I do not know that I cried. Yes, thou didst. Didst thou see anything? Nothing, my lord. Saw you anything? No, my lord, I saw nothing. Go, bid me to my brother Cassius. Bid him set on his powers for times before, and we will follow. Shall be done, my lord. Now, Anthony, our hopes are answered. You said the enemy would not come down and keep the hills in upper region. It proves not so. Their battles are at hand. They mean to warn us that Philippi here, enter before we demand them. Tut, I'm in their bosoms and I know wherefore they do it. They can be content to visit other places and come down with fearful bravery, thinking by this face to fasten in our thoughts that they have courage. But it is not so. Prepare your generals. The enemy comes on in gallant show. Their bloody sign of battle is hung out and something to be done immediately. Octavius. Lead your battle softly on upon the left hand of the even field. Upon the right hand, I keep thou the left. Why do you cross me in this exigent? I do not cross you, but I will do so. We stand and we have parley. Stand fast to me as we must out and talk. Mark Anthony, shall we give sign of battle? No, Caesar. We will answer on their charge. Make forth. The general will have some words. Stir not until the signal. Words before blows, is it so, good woman? Not that we love words better as you do. Good words are better than bad strokes, Octavius. <laughs> Your bad strokes, Brutus, you give good words. Witness the hole you made in Caesar's heart, crying, Long live, hail, Caesar! Why, Antony, the posture of your blows is yet unknown, but for your words they rob the high bees and leave them highless. <laughs> <laughs> and soundless, too. For you have stolen their buzzing, Antony, and very wisely threats before you sleep. <laughs> you did not stow when your vile daggers hacked one another in the sides of Caesar. You shut your teeth like apes, and fawn like hounds, and bowed like bondmen, kissing Caesar's feet, while damned Casca like a cur behind, struck Caesar on the neck. Who oh, flatters, flatters. Now, Brutus, thank yourself. This tongue had not offended so today. Cassius might have ruled. Come, come, the cause. If arguing make us sweat, the proof of it will turn to redder drops. Look, I draw a sword against conspirators. 
When think you that the sword goes up again? Never, until Caesar's three and thirty wounds be well avenged, or till another Caesar hath, Caesar hath added slaughter to the sword of traitors. Oh, Caesar, thou canst not die by traitors' hands, unless thou bringst them with thee. So I hope I was not meant to die on Brutus' sword. Were thou the noblest of thy strain, young man, thou couldst not die more honorable. A uh, peevish is such an honor, joined by a mascot and a reveler. Oh, Come away, Antony. Defy these traitors. Hurl we in your teeth. If you dare fight today, come to the field. If not, when you have stomachs. Why now blow wind, swell billow and swim bark. The storm is up and all is on the hazard. This is my birthday, as this very day was Cassius born. Therefore, most noble Brutus, the gods today stand friendly, that we may, lovers in peace, lead on our days to age. But since the affairs of men rest still uncertain, it's reason the worst that we fall. If we lose this battle, this is the very last time that you and we shall speak together. What are you then determined to do? If we lose this battle, you are contented to be led in triumph through the streets of Rome? No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus will go bound to Rome. He bears too great a mind. <laughs> but this day must end the work the Ides of March begun. Whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, then smile. If not, then this parting was well made. Forever from forever farewell, Brutus. If we do meet again, we'll smile indeed. If not, it's true, this parting was well made. And then lead on. Oh, that a man might know the end of this day's business ere it come. But it sufficeth, the end will come, and then the end will be known. Come, ho. Oh. Joy. Come down, behold 
see my best friend standing before my face. Come hither, Sarah. In Parthia did I take thee prisoner, and then I swore thee saving of thy life that whatsoever I did bid thee do, thou shouldst attempt it. Come now, keep thine oath. Now be a free man, and with this good sword that ran through Caesar's bowels, search this bosom. Stand not to answer, take thou the hilt. And when my face is covered, as tis now, guide thou the sword. Honored. 
and Cato's son. Yield, or thou diest. <laughs> Only I yield to die. There is so much that thou wilt kill me straight. Kill Brutus, and be honored in his death. We must not. A noble prisoner. Room ho! Tell Antony Brutus is tame. I'll tell the news. Here comes the general. Brutus is tame. Brutus is tame, my lord. Where is he? Safe, Antony. Brutus is safe enough. I dare say that the noble Brutus shall never be taken alive by any enemy. And the gods defend him from so great a shame. When you do find him, or alive or dead, he shall be found like Brutus, like himself. This is not Brutus, friend, but I assure you a prize no less than worth. Keep this man safe. Give him all kindness. I'd rather have such men, my friends, than enemies. Go on and see whether Brutus be alive or dead, and bring us word unto Octavius' tent how everything is chanced. Come, poor remains of friends, rest ye on this rock. Cecilius showed the torchlight, but my lord he came not back. He is ordained or slain. Sit you down, Caius. Slaying is the word. It is a deed in faction. Tarking, Caius. Will die, my lord? No, not for all the world. Please, then, no words. I'd rather kill myself. No request to Brutus made to thee. To kill him? Look, he meditates. Now is that noble vessel full of grief, and it overflows even at his eyes. Come hither, good Volumius, list a word. What says, my lord? It is this, Volumius. The ghost of Caesar hath appeared to me two several times by night. At Sardis once, and here this last night in full of my fields. I know my hour has come. Not so, my lord. Has Volumius. Thou seest the world, Volumius, how it goes. Our enemies have beat us to the pit. It is more worthy that we leap in ourselves than tarry till they push us. Volumius, thou knowest that we two went to school together. For that, our love of old, I pray thee, hold thou my sword here with strong Cyronomy. That's not an office for a friend, my lord. Fly! Fly, my lord, fly! There is no tearing here! Goodbye to you. And to you, good Bologna's. Farewell to you, too, straight up. Friends, my heart doth joy that in all my life I never met a man but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day. More than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest can attain unto. So fare you well at once. For Brutus' tongue hath almost ended his life history. Night falls upon mine eyes, my bones would rest that have labored to attain this hour. Fly, fly, my lord, fly! And I will follow. I pray thee, good straight up. Say my lord. Thou art a man of good respect. Thy life hath had some snatch of honor in it. I pray thee, hold thou my sword hilt, and turn thy face away while I run on it. Wilt thou straight up? Give me your hand first. Fare thee well, my lord. Fare thee well, straight up. I will entertain them. Fellow, wilt thou bestow thy time with me? 
I, Masala, will have me. Do so, good Masala. How doth thy master strike? I have the sword and he did well upon me. Then Octavius, take him to follow thee that did the latest service to my master. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He alone, and general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and all the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. According to his virtue, let us use him. With respect and all rites of burial, within my tent tonight his bones shall lie. So call the field to rest, and let's away to part the glories of this happy day. Uh. 